Good and good morning. In our epistle reading this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, St. Paul gives us a compelling insight into what makes him tick. And in doing this, he provides us indirectly with an encouragement concerning some of the things that should make every one of us tick. One of the things that Paul reveals about himself in verses 16 through 18 of 1 Corinthians 9 is a glimpse into his own motivation for evangelization, for preaching the gospel. He basically says that the call to do so is so strong in his life that he has to answer that call and that to do otherwise would be disastrous for him. He says it this way, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. A little personal sidelight here. Very often people will talk to me about having read our story about how we brought Christ the King Parish into the Catholic Church, having been an Anglican parish for a number of years. And the typical reaction that I get from a lot of people who read that story is, wow, it must have taken a lot of courage on your part to do that. And I always have to correct them gently and say, no, 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 you don't understand. It took no courage at all to do this because I was so absolutely convinced that this is what God was calling me and us to do it, to do otherwise for me would have been a grave sin of disobedience, and I did not want to enter into eternity with that kind of act of disobedience on my soul. So no, it took no courage for me to do what I did because I fear God a lot more than I fear human beings. But if we then broaden our understanding of what St. Paul is saying here, we can easily and validly apply it to a number of other things in our lives. We can truthfully say, for example, that God has designed human life in general and the Christian walk in particular in such a way that our reward by God for doing His will is not an arbitrary decision on His part, but is built into obedience. Obedience to God, in other words, is in a very real sense its own reward. And I believe we could accurately say that of reward both in this life and in the life to come. Viewed in that light then, the Word of God and the commands of God become not some arbitrary list of do's and don'ts by some capricious deity up there, but rather the revelation by our loving Heavenly Father of the road map to true joy and true peace in this life and to the glorious attainment then of eternal life. Now, with that as a starting point, Paul moves on to what is the real heart of this passage and what I really want to talk about this morning. Two things, namely, number one, what it means to have liberty in Christ, and number two, what it means to dedicate ourselves resolutely to our God-given task of evangelization. First, in verse 19, St. Paul says this, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. St. Paul first experienced that freedom that he speaks of here on the road to Damascus when Jesus revealed himself to him and turned his world upside down. Actually, upside down is probably a misnomer. We should say Jesus turned his world right side up. Jesus began by unshackling Paul from his attachment to his supposed religious pedigree and from his slavish and pharisaical observance of the Mosaic law. Here's how Paul describes that in Philippians chapter 3. He says, quote, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, 
If any other man thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now, having freed Paul from those things, the Lord went on by grace to free him from some other things as well. And you and I, who are the beneficiaries of that same liberating grace that Paul enjoyed, should be able to, see, to say that we are free from these things as well. Listen carefully. St. Paul was free from other people's expectations of him. His only desire was to please God. He was free from the tyranny of personal ambition. His only ambition was to preach Christ crucified. He was free from the fear of his enemies and from the fear of the enemy. He was free from the bondage of sin. He was free to love those whom God loves. Now take note. Paul was also free from the fear of failure, knowing that if he was steadfastly faithful to God's call on his life, God himself would take responsibility for the outcome of it all. He stated it this way earlier in the same epistle. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who gave the increase. St. Teresa of Calcutta was fond of saying, God doesn't call us to success. He calls us to faithfulness. And by the way, let me pause on this thought for a moment. Freedom from the fear of failure. Do you know that for most people, that, fe that fear of failure is one of the most crippling fears there is? Fear of failure. That's a fear that will stop the call of God in your life dead in its tracks if you allow it to. Because it neutralizes your faith and it paralyzes you into inactivity. It's easy, it's easy when God calls you to do something. It's easy to look around you in the world and find a hundred reasons why you, won't, you don't want to do what God's called you to do because you're afraid of failing in that. Most baseball fans would agree that Babe Ruth was arguably the greatest ball player of all time. A large part of that greatness resides in the fact that the Babe hit 714 home runs in his career, the third highest of any major league player in history, 714 home runs. But what we generally overlook is that in the course of hitting 714 home runs, Babe Ruth struck out 1,330 times, almost twice as many strikeouts as homers. But the fear of striking out, the fear of failing, never deterred him from swinging the bat as hard as he could every time he stepped up to the plate. How much more should you and I, disciples of the Lord Jesus, children of God, not be deterred by the fear of failure as we daily strive to stay faithful to God's call and God's purposes in our lives? If the Son makes you free, Jesus told us, you will be free indeed. Again, let me repeat what St. Paul says in verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. Now, if you want to gain a profound insight into a person's character, observe what he does with his freedom. St. Augustine once wrote this, a man who continually does everything he is permitted to do 
will soon be doing those things he is not permitted to do. Think about that. That's where freedom crosses the line into license. That's why it's important for us to practice spiritual disciplines, disciplines that put a limit on the things that we feel free to do. It's true of individuals. It's also true of whole societies. Let me read it again. A man who continually does everything he is permitted to do will soon be doing those things he is not permitted to do. All you have to do to understand that about our society is look at the rapid downward moral spiral that our popular culture has undergone in the last 50 years, all in the name of so-called freedom. Earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, St. Paul wrote this, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. What Paul did with his freedom was he voluntarily made himself a servant to everyone for the sake of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus said, Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. For the sake of mankind, Jesus became a man. And in doing so, he did something else. He, though sinless, associated himself, identified with intimately sinful humanity, including with you and me, and ultimately took our sins upon himself on the cross. Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah's messianic prophecy of the suffering servant. And he gave dramatic witness to that role by donning a servant's towel and washing his disciples' feet on the very night that his ultimate suffering began. Thus, St. Paul could say quite validly in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus, though God, made himself of no reputation and taking upon himself the form of a bond servant, humbled himself even to death on a cross. Someone once said that the hardest thing about being a servant is that when you are, people treat you like one. And it's true, isn't it? Because while the servant does the work, others get the applause and the attention. In the case of the Christian who voluntarily makes himself or herself a servant of God, it is God who gets the glory for our efforts. St. Paul understood that concept completely. He understood it because he understood Jesus' mandate and Jesus' model for evangelization, for preaching the gospel. Again, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. That I might win the more. Do you ever give much thought to the fact that winning the more is part of what God has called you to do in life? I hope you do, because it is. It is part of God's call on your life, winning the more. Winning the more what? More people, obviously. Winning them for what? Winning them for the kingdom of God and ultimately for heaven. This is one of the primary responsibilities of the church in the world. And when I say the church, yes, the pope, yes, the bishops, yes, the priests and deacons, yes, the consecrated religious, but also, yes, you, the laity, you who make up the vast majority of the church, you, every one of you, are called to preach the gospel, to win the more. You are called to the work of evangelization. Listen to what the Catechism says in paragraph 905. 
Quote, lay people fulfill their prophetic mission by evangelization. That is, by the proclamation of Christ by word and the testimony of their lives. For lay people, this evangelization acquires a specific property and peculiar efficacy because it is accomplished in the ordinary circumstances of the world. Where you live, where you work, where you go to school, where you shop, so forth and so on. So I encourage you this morning, take that call and that responsibility seriously and let nothing deter you from carrying it out. There should be an urgency today in our hearts and souls to do this, as St. Paul says, to win the more. As we look about us at the dire condition of our world, business as usual and the status quo no longer apply. Things are different and are changing rapidly. Whether you know it or not, our culture is in a downward death spiral brought on by countless forces and influences, many of them demonically inspired, demonically motivated. The messages that have come from various apparitions of the Blessed Mother at Lourdes, at Fatima, at Akita, at La Salette, at Garabandal, are coming to fruition and are more relevant, and may I add, more urgent today than when Our Lady first spoke them. So let's you and I commit to heed Mary's warnings given out of love and compassion for her children. Let's do all that we can in these days, in this critical moment of time in which we live, to win the lost. Let's stay faithful to our Lord. Let's stay faithful to his church, walking in the grace and the freedom that Jesus himself has blessed us with, willingly becoming his servants, preaching the gospel both in our words and by our way of life, and then ultimately letting him have both the glory and the responsibility for the results. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>